Well, good evening and welcome to the seventh program of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan's Great Decisions series with topics suggested by the Foreign Policy Association. I'm Michael Vendetta and I'm the Executive Director of the Council and on behalf of my colleagues Erica Kubik and Rachel Brooks and the Board of Directors of the Council, thanks for being here again to learn more about our world, both in person here and online. We're pleased to host the Great Decision Series here at GRCC and we are grateful for President Charles Lepper, for faculty liaison Mike DeVivo, and for Class Quant and his team for hosting us so well and giving us their support and expertise. It's the Council's mission to empower the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. We do that with the help of corporate and university memberships and also individuals. You can be a member of our Council by simply going to our website at worldmichigan.com and signing up for free. And we have individuals that become senator members and donate to our work. You can learn all about that at worldmichigan.org. We're grateful to Wolverine Worldwide for being our series sponsor, to WGVU Public Media as our presenting media sponsor, to the Community Media Center and WYCE as communication assistants, and to Western Michigan University and to Montcalm Community College for being our topic sponsors for this day. We're so pleased tonight to host a UK climate journalist, Guy Vince. Thank you for coming so far to share your subject matter with us. We're delighted that you're here. Wish it was warmer. After her presentation, there will be ample time for questions. For those in the auditorium, you may raise your hand and Eric and I will get you a microphone to ask the question. For those watching on the Council YouTube channel, you simply type your question in the chat box and Erica will get that on her phone and we'll ask the question right here. Remember our council house rules, they are to ask questions respectful of our speaker and succinct so that others have a chance to ask a question. Tonight we welcome Guy Vince, the award-winning science journalist, author, broadcaster, and speaker. She is particularly interested in the interaction between human systems and Earth's planetary systems and she's traveled the world extensively to research this dynamic. She writes books and articles for the BBC, for The Guardian, for New Scientist, for Australian Geographic and Science. She makes and presents science documentaries for radio and television, and she gives talks all over the world. Previously, she has held senior editorial positions at the science journal Nature, Nature Climate Change, and New Scientist. She's also an honorary senior research fellow at University College London's Anthropocene Institute. I say that right? That's a new word for me, Anthropocene. She'll describe it. And she's a fellow at the Royal Society of Arts, Manufacturing, and Commerce. After traveling around the world for 800 days, she wrote an overview of that journey called Adventures in the Anthropocene which won the Royal Science Prize for Science Books, and she is the first woman to win that award. Her next book, Transcendence, explores how a smart ape became a planet-dominating force. It rewrites the story of human ascent, describing the co-evolution of our biology, environment, and more importantly, our culture. She calls it the story of how we made ourselves and where we are headed. Her latest book, and the one we have for sale out at the table this evening, is called Nomad Century. It's an urgent investigation of the most underreported seismic consequence of climate change, how it will force us to change where and how we live. It's a book of solutions and a rousing call to arms, describing how we can plan for and manage the now unavoidable climate migration while we restore our planet to a fully habitable state. The presentation tonight is called Climate Migration and the Nomad Century. Let us welcome Guy Vince. Well, thanks, Michael, and thanks all of you for um, being here tonight. So, 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we... Can, can everybody hear me? Well, if you can't hear me, I guess you won't be able to tell me. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we're going to face um, this century as the decades continue. And at the moment, where we are is somewhere... You can't hear. Is this not turned on? Hello, hello. Is it? <laughs> okay, hopefully I won't be too loud now. Um, so where we are now is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 degrees above the pre-industrial average. Is this, I, is it, it, is, it is working, is it? Because I can't hear it working. Okay, brilliant. And, um, and we are already experiencing very severe extreme weather events. So over the last few years, I'll, I'll just look at uh, some of the things that we've experienced just in the last year. So this um, wildfire event looks like something out of Australia. It was actually London. This, another part of Britain. And if you think about Britain, although people talk about the weather nonstop in England, um, they actually have some of the most boring weather in the world. It's just drizzle most of the time. We don't get extreme snowfall like you had on Saturday, apparently, um, or extreme anything, but that's changing. We, we now are getting extreme weather. Um, in the United States, of course, reservoirs running dry, west coast on fire most of the time, the east coast flooded, um, intense storms, people having to be rescued by helicopter, Thousands of cattle died at the beginning of last year in, in the States. Um, people had to be rescued from Kentucky in, helico in helicopters. Um, it's severe weather, extreme weather is hitting um, places across the States. There are droughts, floods, fire, um, intense heat. And these are the sorts of things that make people uh, they displace people. So um, South Asia was horrifically warm. Um, they had months and months in India and Pakistan of unbearable heat, um, only to be hit straight after with enormous floods. And this uh, continual back-to-back -back effect where you get uh, one extreme event followed very quickly by... Um, another one. It wears down communities' resilience. It means that they can't recover from one thing in, and, and get their strength back up because they hit straight away with something else. This is the States. Um, people can't live in these houses when they're like this. This is Australia. I'm, I'm also half Australian and uh, these are uh, bushfires that uh, swept across uh, enormous parts of the state. You had intense fires um, across uh, the US as well last year. I Friends of mine uh, described how even though they weren't actually affected by the fires themselves, they couldn't open any windows because of the air pollution was so intense. And uh, during COVID, that was a particular problem. Um, with you know it being very hot and you can't ventilate and um, and so on. Um, straight after the bushfires that um, affected my aunt in northern New South Wales, they then had this. Um, and uh, she sent me a photo, actually, I haven't got it because it's not very high resolution, of her uh, community centre floating down the river. Um, and she's, she's in her 70s and she's still um, building, helping to build these kind of kit houses for... for um, climate refugees, for people who um, were affected by the floods or by fire. So what do we expect over the coming century? Well, the problem is that we are geoengineering our planet. We are injecting our atmosphere with greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrate, other greenhouse gases, which are trapping the, the heat of the sun. They're trapping the sun's energy. And this extra energy is what is driving these more intense storms, these, um, these heat dome 
these heat domes that sit over regions for long periods of time. So you don't just get a heat wave of a day or two. We're now getting it for weeks, sometimes months. That's very hard to adapt to. It's also driving these uh, perturbations in ocean circulation. Um, and we are now approaching tipping points in, in various Earth systems, including um, including the Gulf Stream, which uh, would have huge, huge ramifications. Uh, we're also getting, we're also approaching tipping points in um, greenhouse glacial melt, in, um, what is that? <laughs> in, in greenhouse glacial melt, in um, coral reef, uh, ecosystems, they are, they are dying, in um, Amazon rainforest die-off, and these, these tipping points in Earth systems, what they mean is once you pass them, you, you, you uh, experience a step change. It means that you need an enormous amount of energy to return to a former system. So if you think about it as uh, the final straw that broke the donkey's back, um, I don't know if that's a saying in the States, um, so, so you keep piling on the sticks, and then finally one tiny twig is enough to break the donkey's back. Well, you can't just withdraw that tiny twig and the donkey's back returns. That's not possible because you've passed a tipping point. And the point is with these Earth systems, once you pass that tipping point, that incremental change that we've been experiencing, it moves to a different phase and you can't just reverse it. So that's why tipping points are so dangerous. But nevertheless, let's look ahead at where we are today. So, um, so the IPCC, uh, which models climate um, uh, scenarios and uh, looks, at, looks at where we're going, the modelers have come up with different pathways, economic pathways, um, and the emissions that they would produce. Um, so RCP 2.6, we won't, that's a fantasy. That would be lovely, but it's an absolute fantasy. We're, we're, we're going to exceed 1.5 degrees. Well, we're going to exceed it probably this year because of the Toba eruption, which injected large amounts of water vapor into the atmosphere, and water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Um, but it's only present in the atmosphere briefly, so um, the temperatures may dip below that, but they will exceed 1.5 degrees within the next six or seven years, and then the temperature will only rise. The good news is that RCP 8.5 is also very unlikely now. This is the original business as usual scenario. And these are very, very frightening temperatures and it, they would lead to, <coughs> they would lead to um, uh, meters of sea level rise very soon. So we're not going to, we're not going to reach that. So that's good news. We are currently charting somewhere between RCP 4.5 and RCP 6.0. So um, as you can see with both of those, a temperature at the end of the century of between three and four degrees is, it's not unlikely, okay? And this is extremely, extremely serious. At the moment, we are told that keeping below 1.5 degrees is um, essential. We're not going to keep below that. So um, let's cast our imaginations a little further. We can, you know, we can still survive. It will mean extreme changes, but we are going to almost certainly exceed two degrees by the end of the century as well. And you know, with every 0.1 of a degree, we experience severe changes in livability. As I was saying, we're somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 degrees at the moment of, above the pre-industrial average, and we're already experiencing some quite extreme effects. There is, you know, these effects are everywhere in the planet. We, we are getting um, unusual temperatures, unusual climate chaos. So, much colder weather when we wouldn't expect it, much, much hotter weather. And the trend is for, um, for hotter weather. 
So let's look at uh, four degrees by the end of the century and what that means. So if you look at our globe, um, at the moment our species is dispersed everywhere with the African ape that went everywhere on the planet. Most of the population is however living in a tropical belt. And as you can see, the, uh, the multiple severe impacts are mainly felt in that tropical belt. That is a tropical belt of unlivability, certainly for many months of the year. It doesn't mean that people will not be able to live there at all, but certainly not in the huge numbers that we have at the moment. People will have to move from those areas. And as you can see nearer the top um, of the planet, things are looking a bit better. So at the moment, um, about 1% of the Earth's land surface is unlivable due to extreme heat. By 2070, that is expected to be 20% of the planet. And this is home to around a third of the world's population. So the world is um, currently um, home to 8 billion people. By 2070, it will be somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people. So we're talking about 3 billion people living in um, unlivable conditions just because of heat. But, um, you know, as I showed you before, there are multiple severe impacts. So flooding as well. If you look at the coastlines, river deltas where most of our cities are, um, drought, which is um, has huge effects, uh, huge implications for agriculture. It's more... Drought is, is a bigger effect on um, agricultural yields than heat. Um, and fire. Fire is um, severe. So let's look at heat. And the problem with heat and humans, so we're mammals, and that means that we need to maintain a certain body temperature um, in, order, in order to survive. And the problem with um, heat is when it's combined with humidity. So the way we maintain our body temperature is by sweating. It's evaporative cooling. As the sweat evaporates, um, it takes energy from our bodies and that cools us down. But if there's a lot of um, humidity, our, our bodies can't sweat. So the, the sweat just sits there and it doesn't evaporate. So we don't cool and we get heat exhaustion and die quite quickly. So um, the way we measure that is the most basic kind of equipment. It's called the wet bulb temperature. And um, you literally wrap a, um, a, a wet rag around a thermometer and it's the temperature at which um, that doesn't um, change when you um, heat it. Now, the, uh, the limit, the threshold for survivability used to be uh, thought of as a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees and there was nowhere until very recently on earth where that was exceeded. Now there are some places that that's been exceeded. But in fact, scientists last year published um, a study which shows that that wet bulb temperature may have been completely wrong and actually that the threshold for survivability might be a wet bulb temperature of somewhere between 25 and 28 degrees Celsius. I'm giving you only Celsius because um, I don't speak Fahrenheit, I'm afraid. <laughs> so <laughs> um, now we know that there have been some um, severe heat waves recently that have killed a large number of people. So um, in 2003, uh, thir 30,000 um, people died um, in, in Europe of an extreme heat. And um, in uh, 2010, in, in uh, Russia, uh, something like 50,000 people died from a heat wave. And in neither of those um, two events did the wet bulb temperature exceed 28 degrees. So that gives you an idea of, um, of how important heat and humidity can be uh, to, to our survivability. And um, it's also worth noting that the people who are most vulnerable are the same people who are most vulnerable, were most vulnerable in COVID, you know, um, immunocompromised, elderly, the poorest people generally. Um, so this isn't, uh, this doesn't hit everybody equally. But at, at this, uh, you know, the, the limit of survivability is when 
Um, it's defined as when a healthy, young, fit person dies within five hours from these conditions. So um, it's a problem. Now at two degrees, and I think we're very likely to exceed two degrees um, at the end of this century, this is where heat stress is likely to be um, a, a very strong threat for much of the year. Um, and as you can see, it's still the same places. It's the same key places. It's this um, belt around the tropics. And this is a reminder of four degrees. And as you can see, it stretches all the way down to Australia, most of Africa, most of uh, Latin America, up through, you know, into even parts of Canada, the, the lower bits, um, up into Asia. So, you know, what's the solution? What's the solution to this? Um, let's just talk about what this means in terms of in terms of humans moving. So we exceed those conditions already. There are places on our planet that are unlivable. You look at somewhere like Dubai, Qatar. They're they're effectively unlivable, and yet people live there. A large, uh, a small population of relatively wealthy people live in essentially sealed um, air-conditioned shopping malls, right? Everything they need is brought in, whether it's food, water, other resources. And people who work outside, like construction workers um, and other laborers, well, they die of heat stress, kidney failure, um, as we've seen. So, um, when we have our four-degree world, the solution really is that we will need to move people from the uh, unsafe areas to the safe areas. And that largely means, because as you can see, there's not much land south, it means moving north to the northern latitudes. Not everyone will have to move. This is Mumbai. Okay, Mumbai is a city of somewhere in the mid 20s, perhaps um, as many as 30 million people live there. And around 9 million of these people live in um, slum housing, which are um, effectively concrete boxes with metal roofs. And the temperatures at the moment um, in those slum houses are somewhere between um, 6 and 10 degrees above the temperature in the, uh, the city proper. And while we, they, they have um, air conditioning units in some of the businesses and um, uh, apartment blocks in the city, there is no way that all these people can adapt to these extreme conditions. They will have to move. So Nomad Century is my book about, it's being pragmatic about what we face and what our choices are and how we achieve it. And what it means is moving people to cities in the far north, and it means we will have to um, expand existing cities, and we will have to build entirely new cities. It calls for imaginative ideas around governance, around how we might make this work, around reducing the numbers of people who will have to migrate through um, strong adaptive policies and financing those policies in countries that are most affected. But really it means facing up honestly to the threats that we will experience and what this changed world will look like because it's not an incrementally different world from what we are experiencing now. It is a radically different world. It's very, very different and large numbers of people will be very vulnerable. People are already, they're already climate migrants. Um, migration is inevitable. It's already underway. How do we manage it? So let's um, talk briefly um, about some of the cities that we will form. So, you know, this century is an upheaval in every way. We're going to have to change everything about the way we live because nowhere on earth will be unaffected by climate change. Here in Grand Rapids, um, you're likely to be a receiver of immigrants rather than a producer. Um, and most of these, many of these immigrants will be coming from other parts of the United States that are already 
being affected? Um, how will your city respond? So the most successful cities at the moment are, oh, I will, I will <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I'll just say that this is an opportunity as well. This is an opportunity to build a more equal world and a more sustainable world because what we have right now is broken in so many ways. We have a crisis, a climate crisis. We have a biodiversity crisis. We have a poverty crisis, a global inequality crisis, a national inequality crisis. Okay, we can do much better. We can produce energy cheaper and cleaner. We can have cleaner air, cleaner water, more vibrant uh, communities, more vibrant wildlife. Um, and so bringing us to the next slide, we are also facing a demographic shortage um, in the US, in, in, in the Western world, and in many parts of the world, actually, in China, um, in Japan. This is Japan where adult diapers are outselling infant diapers. We're not having enough babies to support an aging population. The solution to many of our economic problems that we're shoring up right? Because we have a social contract where young people through their taxes help pay for um, elderly care and for services to look after older people. The solution is immigration. Right now, much of the world is, is um, facing, like global population is 8 billion. It is likely to peak in the uh, 2060s. And then from there, it's expected to actually decline, perhaps down to today's levels by the end of the century. And that's for two reasons. The main one is actually urbanization. When people move from rural communities into cities, they tend to have fewer children. And that's happening at a pace around the world. Also, women's education, that's another key factor. So we are facing a demographic shortage. In Africa, where um, in many parts of Africa, populations are still growing, they are producing young, healthy, educated people ready, ready to further their opportunities, ready for work. But they're producing people in a place, in a landscape, which is riven and ravaged by climate disasters. Those people will try and find work in places like here, all around the world, where all around the northern, uh, the, the far north, above the, above the 45th parallel and a bit below, where there are opportunities. We should embrace that and we should make it work. Make it work for these people who will have been very traumatized by climate disasters as they are already. Now, Migration is a survival adaptation. It's an adaptation that all animals and plants even use. We are seeing it happening now. We're seeing populations of various fish species, butterflies, birds, uh, you know, other insects are already moving completely. We're seeing the tree line moving. We're seeing flowers um, in, in new places. We're seeing that movement. It's completely natural. And in places where, um, where species go extinct, the reason they will go, because of climate change, one of the main reasons is because humans have thwarted their migration. They've built roads in the way. They've built um, cities or they've destroyed habitat that allow these species to move. Now, humans are exactly the same, right? Humans move according to the climate. When there were ice ages, humans retreated from certain places. When the ice retreated, the human populations expanded again over those areas. And we have, throughout our history, we have migrated everywhere. And we do it through networks of community. People will try to move away from danger, as they should, over the coming decades. How will we, how will we treat those people? 
you know, at the moment, our immigration system is completely broken. Our migration, our global migration policies are completely broken. There is no um, organized way for people who who seek work in another country to move to to help um, to help be part of the productive story of that nation to move easily. It's very hard. This is not a good system. We need to we need to think better. We need to think bigger. We need to start talking about how we can plan this so that it is a success story rather than reeling from one crisis to another. You know, when I look into the future and I think about um, my two small children who are in primary school at the moment and I think about their future, you know, I don't want them to be conscripted into an army to fight, you know, Bangladeshi migrants or migrants from Nigeria. You know, I would much rather that they were living in denser cities with a Bangladeshi neighbor and a Nigerian neighbor. That's the sort of future that I think is much more livable. This is the world's largest refugee camp, um, which I visited uh, a couple of times. It's, um, it's in Bangladesh. These are the Rohingya people. Um, who fleed Burma because of a uh, horrible genocide. Now this is, they are living on a sort of denuded hillside in camps made of, you know, uh, polythene and um, bamboo. They, um, every time it rains, they get enormous landslides, everything's washed away, there are periodic fires nonstop. Um, these people are essentially living in a prison they're not allowed to work in Bangladesh. They're not, they have no status, right? They don't have um, a Myanmar uh, passport or citizenship, even though that's where they come from. They don't have Bangladeshi citizenship. They're stateless. They're living in limbo and children are living like this. They don't have um, an education either. They have some sort of ad hoc system where various people sort of teach each other, but it's not an education system. Um, this is not a solution. This is one million people living in a city, but it isn't a city because cities are places of hope and productivity. Cities are places of immigration where people come in, join that project to make something bigger than themselves. This is, a, this is essentially a prison. We, we have to do better than this. And there are so many of these around the world of different sizes. And most of them most refugees are held in poor nations in the global south. The numbers that come to rich, no, rich nations are actually very small. It's a very small part. You might, you might um, imagine that, um, that there is some sort of deluge coming from Mexico. It's tiny compared to um, the refugees that are in Uganda or, or Jordan or various other nations. But we can do better. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a moment of reckoning for the EU member states. They had to decide what they were gonna do with these millions of refugees that were pouring across the border. There was more than a million came across in less than a week. And they decided, unbelievably actually to me, they decided unanimously that they were going to grant Ukrainians EU, um, they were going to grant them indefinite, well, for, th for three years, leave to remain, to work, access to healthcare, to education, to move around all the member states. And that undoubtedly saved millions of lives. And they decided that really from one day to the next. And I tell you what, a lot of these member states, when the Ukrainians do go back to Ukraine, not all of them will, but when they do go back, they're going to struggle to replace those jobs because they're actually doing a very valuable service. Right, so this is what most refugee camps look like, and this is what 
most urban expansion looks like around the world at the moment. As people come to cities, they squat, essentially. They're not allowed to live where they're living, so they don't have access to sewage, they don't have access to clean water supplies, they don't have access to um, any of the services that we take for granted. So they build up shanty towns which are very vulnerable to landslides, to all sorts of disaster, and they can be evicted at a moment's notice. A whole, you know, a whole community can just go. We need to build smarter cities. But when I say new, smarter cities, I don't mean this sort of city, right? This is not efficient. This is not going to be the solution to millions of people moving. This is extremely inefficient use of, uh, use of land and it depends entirely on cars. We've moved on now, we're in the Anthropocene. We don't need to live this lifestyle anymore. We can do better. So walkable cities, the optimum is somewhere between four and six stories. You know, maybe a story more, maybe a story less, but four to six stories high is the, uh, the optimum me measure for social cohesion, for community forming, with public spaces where people can congregate, where it's completely walkable or cyclable, where everything is uh, that you need is with an, within around 15 minutes. And that means no zoning. It means you don't have the commercial zone over here, the industrial zone over here, the residential zone over here. It means everything is intermingled. And when everything is intermingled, so are the people, right? Because if one thing has taught us through history, the only sort of progress that we've made as a species, everything we invent from democracy, to public libraries, to the Pfizer vaccine, has been a collaboration. It's been people coming together to make something work. We need to, more than ever now that we're facing these global crises, we need to come together. We have one joint enemy, and that is carbon dioxide <laughs> in our atmosphere. It's climate change. It affects all of us. That's who we should be. Uh, working um, against. So this kind of city architecture, this kind of city planning is essential, but it will have to be adapted. Everything will be, have to be adapted for climate change. Our food systems will have to be adapted. So most of the places where we currently grow our food in the world are going to be um, severely affected by climate change, by drought, by uh, floods, by desalination, by salination, like the water um, incursion into the um, into the water table, seawater incursion. Um, it means we're going to have to think differently about food. Yeah, it might. It will mean eating um, insect protein. You don't have to eat it like that. We eat a lot of processed foods. One one type of meat protein is the same as another. Many people around the world already eat insects. I've eaten them. Delicious. You should try them. It also means looking at novel types of foods. So we're talking about um, bacterial vats, fungal vats, algal vats. It means growing, growing our food, marine algae. It means um, thinking about, you know, once we get much more abundant electrical energy from the sun, we can start thinking about uh, more, you know, inside greenhouses in um, in the zones where we're going to be living, which is further north, right? We're going to have to think about how we feed people large scale. And it's at the moment, our food systems are utterly broken. And a large part of that is because of the way that we um, produce meat. We need to eat a lot less meat, particularly in the United States, where they, um, it's just completely unsustainable. If the rest of the world ate the sort of diet um, that you guys eat, um, well, it, it just would not be possible. And um, there's many reasons for this. Uh, one, one is that um, at the moment, meat, so meat is very, very uh, inefficient use of, uh, of land and of, it's a very inefficient way of getting our calories and our, our protein. At the moment, 
huge tracts of rainforest are um, are leveled so that we grow food to feed cattle and to feed livestock. Um, and then we eat the livestock. We only get about 10% of the original soil or whatever we're growing at the original end. It doesn't mean we don't eat meat at all, but it means we eat it, you know, maybe three times a week rather than every day and not in the quantities. And it's also a massive health hazard. And, um, you know, it's a, it, it contributes to greenhouse gas pollution, methane, um, and uh, the amount of nitrates. So if we ate much more plant-based diet, that would be much more sustainable. We need to, um, you know, transition our energy. We're already doing that, actually. We're, we're undergoing the biggest revolution in energy. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. We, I talked about tipping points earlier in the Earth system. We have now passed a tipping point, a social tipping point, in terms of uh, renewable energy. We're not going back to fossil fuels. That is dead. People don't realize it's dead, but it's dead. Um, and, you know, they're trying to get the last gasp out of it. But the future is renewable. Um, I wouldn't have believed even five years ago that Today, we're in a situation where it is cheaper to, uh, to build an entirely new solar power station or wind power station than it is to keep supplying fuel to an existing coal-fired power station. That's where we are. It's much cheaper. It's much cleaner. And once you've set up that infrastructure, you don't have to keep refueling it, right? Your energy's free. Think about that for some of the poorest parts of the world who currently have no access to energy. Having said that, this uh, renewable transition still needs to go somewhere between two and five times faster than it is if we are to um, if we're to meet you know anywhere near um, a net zero target. Right, so. What I'm talking about is mass migration. I'm talking about large numbers of people moving from largely from the global south um, up to northern latitudes. It's an absolute tragedy for people who are forced to migrate. It's horrific. Um, not everybody will have to move, but large populations will not be able to be sustained under those conditions. I think that we need to talk about this. I think we need to plan for it and plan ways of managing it. Because the alternative is really horrific. And the idea that we can build walls, turn back boats is, it's a fantasy. We won't. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> You know, we, we, uh, we are already experiencing conflict in large parts of the world. Let's not make it worse. Um, there is a lot of support among young people, particularly for a world with more open borders. And economically, it makes enormous amounts of sense. We have trade agreements across countries, between countries, for everything from um, moving money to resources to, um, to goods. And yet, our biggest economic resource is human labor. And we prevent people from moving. At the moment, in my country, we have labor shortages in everything from hospitality to truck drivers to dentists to nurses to teachers in every aspect. And that is largely the result of Brexit policy, which has um, which has been ruinous for the um, for the economy, um, but particularly in terms of labour, and the um, COVID pandemic didn't help with with uh, with labour movements. So, the economic argument actually for increased immigration is is pretty solid. Now we've been through a a few years now and it's ongoing of populist leaders and the easiest trope of a populist leader is to is to demonize um is to demonize uh, certain groups marginalized people immigrants um black people poor people people of 
Muslims, whatever. That's that's a very, very easy trope. And what it's led to is this um, inflamed, hostile, really toxic narrative about refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants generally. I feel that there has been a massive abdication of responsibility from, from other leaders, from opposing politicians to really address this and to, to, to do a sort of a, a, a reality fact check. Because when it comes to, when it comes to unemployment, you know, immigration does not raise un unemployment. The reverse is true. Immigration does not drive down wages. The reverse is true. Immigration does not raise crime. The reverse is true. And countless studies have proved this over and over. Before immigration to work, it needs to be backed. It needs to be backed by financial investment to make sure that everybody has access, that immigrants have access to um, healthcare and school places, housing, basic infrastructure. But it also needs social investment. We need to build a much more inclusive narrative. We need to change the way we see citizenship, what it means to be an American, a Brit, someone from France. We need to change that mindset to be more inclusive, to realize that people come and they, we all create our city, we create our state. It's not in a state of stasis. Stasis is death. Everything changes all the time and we need to properly invest in that inclusive narrative. And that takes real commitment to make it work. Economists reckon that um, if all of the world's borders were removed, global GDP would soar by at least double, if not treble. We don't have to remove borders entirely, but we do have to, in my opinion, we have to make it much easier for people to move to work. People move for work and they move to where the work is. So, uh, you know, it makes sense. Right, I'm just um, going to wrap up quickly because I realize I've talked way too long. Sorry, apologies. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about one other alternative. So if you didn't, you know, this my, mass migration is going to happen. Um, but how the degree to which it happens um, is not known. So estimates are, you know, anywhere from um, tens of millions to one and a half billion by 2050. Depends. And it depends on lots of things. Depends on how much adaptation these countries um, can do, how much we help pay for that. Depends on how much uh, mitigation we do, of course. But we also have the potential to uh, change the temperature of our atmosphere. We could reduce the temperature. Instead of geoengineering by injecting um, carbon molecules into our atmosphere, we could geoengineer by injecting sulfate molecules into our stratosphere, which would reflect back some of the sun's heat. This isn't easy. It's controversial. It would re require global negotiation to, um, to decide how we might do it, when we might do it, what the parameters would be, what, how we would compensate places that experience negative effects and so on. But it would mean fewer people um, having to migrate. It would mean people could practice agriculture in places that would otherwise be impossible. And it's much easier to adapt when the conditions aren't so extreme. So I'm just putting that out there as well. So we, <laughs> I want to say two things. First of all, migration is not a security issue. At the moment, it is classed as a security issue by government agencies generally. It's not a security issue. It is an economic issue and, of course, a humanitarian issue. We need to completely reframe how we think about this. And the other thing is that the future is not written, right? We have choices. We need to face up to the reality of what we are going to experience. The climate models are very clear. And we need to face up to what those choices are, discuss them. And happily, we live in a democracy. We can then decide 
which way we want to go. We can make our future. We can have a vision and take steps to make it. Um, yeah, that's all. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for, um, for, for listening. Let's thank Gaia. Thank you so much for giving us a lot to think about. Uh, 616-308-6560 if you want to text your question. Uh, you want to raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone. And those of you on the YouTube channel, you would just uh, type your question in the chat box and we'll get it in here to ask, uh, ask a, a question. So um, is anybody working on this internationally? <laughs> um, you know, what you've called for is global collaboration and compassion, two things we don't seem to see very much in our world. But is, this, is the UN working on this? Is someone else working yeah, on this? Yeah, so, so there are Good. small projects. And, you know, I'm quite often, quite often people will say, oh, no, you know, we've, we've seen the history. People are always fighting. Um, you know, this will never happen. I don't know if it will happen, but I do know that nothing happens without us imagining it first, discussing it among ourselves, and then going out there as communities to advocate for what we want. Nothing good that we have, all the things that we have that we enjoy, they came from that. People thought, oh, it's not possible. And then here we are, right? We have democracies, we have votes for women, we have the end of slavery. We have all sorts of things that were unimaginable at one time. And they came about. And they came about because people imagined them in their head. They told a story of what they wanted and came together to bring it. And you know what? Also, the last COP meeting that we had in November, last November, in that meeting, I mean, the cops, yeah, there's, there's a lot to criticize the cops for. Very, very slow process. And, you know, we're in this mess because that hasn't been a lot faster. But first of all, I think the cops are unusual because they do something which no other organization does in that whether you are the leader of a tiny, weeny little nation in Micronesia or the leader of the great big United States, you have a place at that table. Everyone has a place at that table. And that's really extraordinary and I think should be valued. And the other thing is, at that last COP meeting, rich countries agreed to pay money to pay losses and damages that poor countries have experienced because of climate change. That's a big deal. I mean, yes, you know, we could go better, we can go bigger, and we will build on that. But just think in your mind what that says, okay? It says, first of all, we know that we are richer than you and that you're in a more vulnerable position, and we're willing to pay for your country um, and to pay for your people. But secondly, there is an acknowledgement there that rich countries are largely rich because their ancestors made the conditions that are causing the losses and damaging damages of the poor countries. And I think that's really exciting. That's a really exciting bit of progress that we can build on. Okay, we got a question here. And just, uh, we're gonna have a lot of questions. So succinct questions, please, if you can, and let uh, Guy explain. The, your, your pitch to us, is to, you know, it's the kind of thing we all sort of, not all, but learn growing up, you know, be good people, take care of others, uh, help people that need it, and so on. But, and now you describe there are the, the groups that are, are trying to come up with these plans of action around the world and get them implemented. But most of that has not made it into the general discourse. Um, and so, you know, we can sit here ignorant. Our politicians, even if they know something, they don't intend to act on it. What is, are some thoughts about what can move some of these thoughts into the general discourse at the state, local level, 
I mean, not just to hear our mayor went to a meeting somewhere, who cares, uh, the national levels. What is there that can move this so that it becomes a more active force as let's say abolitionism finally did after decades and centuries of being talked about without much momentum? What can do the things you're talking about to make it move forward? Well, you know, it, it starts with coming together with like-minded people to campaign, to press your, your local politicians, to press the national politicians, the same way that, that anything gets changed. You know, it, this is all down to policy. We need to start local. We need to build that. But ultimately, this is a global problem, and it needs to be sorted out by global leaders coming together. But at both ends, right, we also need local communities to act so that, so that when, um, when refugees come, when um, immigrants come from wherever, they are, uh, there is understanding and there is acceptance and there is this, um, there is this acknowledgement that they're part of, part of the society. They're part of what it means to be from Grand Rapids. Um, so even in wealthy nations, we have not eradicated poverty, inequality, things like that. You mentioned that um, immigration is one of the solutions potentially to this problem and will enable us to deal with the, these nomadic populations. Can you reference a country that has been particularly adept at integrating disproportionately large numbers of immigrants, housing them, feeding them, pulling them into the, the labor force efficiently? Yes. Um, so different countries have, have um, done better and worse at this than others. Um, Canada has done you know, is, has done pretty well at this. Um, I'll give you an example from, um, from a, a part of Spain in Madrid where they made a decision to, they were getting a lot of um, immigrants from North Africa coming across um, from Spain and they made a decision to, um, to allow people to give them visas for um, two years uh, to to work and um, then they could bring families and become full citizens and they um, enlarged their housing stock they um, they uh, in a certain suburb of Madrid they uh, improved the access the um, public transport access to the city so that it wasn't cut off they brought in loads of different projects to um, to um, help um, people feel included in Madrid and um, all around. And it was extremely successful. And in, in fact, when the global recession hit and other um, places with a lot of immigrant populations became, there were lots of protests and civil unrest, there was nothing in this community. It, it got on with it. It was um, because they felt, they didn't feel disenfranchised in the same way and they weren't resented in the same way. Um, you know, there are, poverty is a huge issue in this country, um, so is inequality, um, lack of access to all sorts of um, things that in other countries it's taken for granted. And these are policy choices, right? This is a policy choice. It doesn't happen by accident that you get, you know, free healthcare. It doesn't happen by accident that you get um, that that uh, that you wipe out homelessness. These are policy choices. So um, if you feel strongly about that, the way forward really is to demand more of your politicians. And you know, my country is also failing its local population, let alone um, any immigrant population. But again, these are policy choices. Um, yeah, and, and we can't afford these sorts of policy accidents, I call them, <laughs> you know.
you know, as we move forward this century, because the crises that we face are so big and so um, strong that we we are going to have to need states that with governments that actually provide these for their citizens, that actually work harder to to provide um, infrastructure. We're going to have to change and adapt everything, you know, for this new climate. With heavier precipitation here, it means that you're going to have to think about street surfaces, about um, you know, to make sure that they they um, absorb water differently. You're going to have to think about um, the way the buildings are are um, the materials used, the, the the way buildings, instead of using energy, they should be pr um, producing energy themselves. You know, there's going to be big changes everywhere. Um, we can't also have people, you know, who don't have basic, where the, where the state is not providing the, the most basic um, levels of uh, for its citizens. I think it's, it's not great. When you talk about the need for um, vision to, to uh, create the kind of changes that we need, what I'm wondering is if you have advice or success stories on how people have found the balance between the, the truly bleak nature of what's going to happen in large parts of the world and how we can balance that with the vision of something that's hopeful. So I'm wondering if you have a success story there or suggestions on how as community organizers we can find that balance that will help actually motivate people I think there are several European cities that in the last sort of decade have radically transformed the way the city works in terms of transport so instead of um, instead of being car centric, they've virtually banned cars from large parts of the cities and they've become greener, they've become community spaces, there's a lot more cycling and uh, walking. And once you do that, everything changes. You know, not just that you have cleaner air, but it means like cafes can pop up, it means young people have places to congregate and don't feel sort of alienated and don't spend all their time sort of you know, on their devices hidden away because they have places to meet that are safe and that are part, they're part of the community and, and it's an intergenerational community because it's a public space. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's very hopeful to me. Um, I find this, um, I find this renewable uh, transition extremely exciting, the speed it's going as well. Um, and there are other transitions, you know, there's the electric vehicle one, but there's this, this move now towards, um, you know, non-dairy, I know this is a dairy state, but um, the move to, to non-dairy, all the different types of um, milks that you can have, even the, in the smallest um, store you can go in and there's a variety of different choices. Um, if you're a vegan, it's you know, it's not hard to find food. I mean, we are transitioning to a more sustainable way of living. And and also when I talk to young people, they're so much more engaged in these issues, in the in the need to be sustainable, in um you know, there are also huge uh there are huge changes that have happened. I've I've spoken about the biodiversity crisis, but we've also done a lot to restore certain areas you know, to, um, to restore populations that, that were on the brink. We've brought them back. We've um, reforested areas. Uh, we're bringing beavers back to the UK at the moment, <laughs> which is, um, yeah, you have them here, but we lost the European beaver for a long time in, in Britain, and now we're bringing them back, and that helps, you know, with the whole river ecosystem, seeing changes that we haven't seen for hundreds of years. We don't eat beavers. <laughs> do you eat beavers here? Oh, no. I don't know. You I've, do? I've got a couple of text questions, then we'll move back to the live audience. But uh, first, um, looking at Richard Attenborough's recent documentary that showed how quickly nature recovered during lockdown, is having a periodic pause in our carbon emissions an option 
versus across the board reductions. And then the second question, um, haven't the waves of refugees we've already seen from Syria, Central America, Ukraine, and other places um, produced uh, populist governments you mentioned early on? And what can break the cycle of immigration uh, reactiveness? Right. Um, well, the first question, um, what's stopping production? Uh, well, no, I don't want to see more pandemics, if that's what that question is. <laughs> that was horrific. And, um, you know, these are complex issues, right? So greenhouse gas is awful, but production is part of you know, what keeps our human system going, our economic system. And um, when productivity becomes, uh, we need to decouple economic growth from, um, from environmental destruction. Absolutely, we do. And uh, several countries are already decoupling it from carbon pollution, although, you know, we need to go further than that. But, you know, economic growth is is um, very necessary. Otherwise, we have poverty and dep deprivation and um, extreme hardship. So that's not the solution at all. Um, but we do need to, obviously, we need to stop. We, we, the, I think it's inexcusable that um, states are still exploring new uh, fossil fuel reserves, especially rich countries. Absolutely. It's obscene when we have this. We already, if we use the existing uh, fossil fuel um, uh, extraction that we have, we're already way exceeding our carbon budget. So that's just a death knell. And the other one, yes, so if we don't manage immigration properly, as we need to do, we need to plan and manage how this migration will happen. At the moment, we are walking into a disaster. If you think what happened when the uh, Syrian refugees came, when uh, Afghanistan, um, uh, the refugees from there, from Ukraine, if you think that was a disaster, like you have no idea what's coming, um, which is why we need to talk about it. We need to manage it because that was not managed well at all. And yes, I do think it contributed. I think bad management of um, immigration definitely contributes to, um, to uh, populism, but it contributes to uh, conflict with um, existing populations, which is why we need proper investment and it needs to be properly managed um, financially and, and socially. That's absolutely key. Otherwise, we do have that. If you look at, if you look at Sweden, Sweden's very, very generous uh, refugee policy. So it accepted a lot of um, refugees from Syria and Afghanistan. Um, and it invested in um, housing and healthcare. Brilliant. But it didn't do that very important social investment. It did not invest in inclusivity properly. So the Swedes did not think of the immigrants as Swedish. The immigrants did not think of themselves as Swedish. They were very, very separate, segregated communities. And that builds um, distrust, conflict, um, a bit of a black market, which then competes with the formal market, um, illegal activities, um, the rise of the far right. We can do a lot better than that. We must learn from that mistake which is being repeated everywhere, by the way. I'd like to go to the climate change issue that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And um, yeah, right. The Hello. Third, world countries, <laughs> third world countries don't really have modern uh, electric grids or infrastructure, and they're using a lot of carbon sources for electricity, heat, and cooking. Some of the most polluting sources, wood. Um, they also use some of the highest polluting cars that we have. They're not using electric, they're using old technology. Do you see them advancing fast enough to contain climate change? Yeah. So um, access to energy is, um, I think, a basic human right. And there are large numbers of people across the world who do not have access to electricity or um, energy at all. So as a result, some of the worst environmental destruction in the world is caused by a lack of access to energy. And I've been to many places where 
people are doing back breaking work, carrying, um, you know, they're traveling for miles to carry water or to, um, or to uh, find, chop down the last remaining trees to burn for charcoal. Um, they, they are working without without you know they, they're cooking inside with these terrible toxic fumes they don't have light for homework or, or to power computers or anything like that obviously um, they need energy they absolutely need access to energy and clean energy could be a brilliant resource for these people and in some places there has been a leapfrogging of um, of you know the whole grid infrastructure and communities kind of own their own solar setups. Now, these are mostly being provided by NGOs. Not They're not state provided. But to go into one of these places is absolutely revolutionary. It it's just completely changes the entire village. Um, and so, yes, you know, once, <laughs> once they get that, it's brilliant. Um, in terms of the most polluting cars, I mean, yeah, they... Most many of these places don't have cars at all, so um, so that's uh, you know <laughs> if you want to talk about cars, the most ridiculously large cars, unnecessarily large cars, are in this country, um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> that is more of a problem, I would say, <laughs> actually. Um, you know. Some of these countries like Indonesia are actually um, some of the fastest adopters of these small little Chinese electric vehicles. Um, it's quite amazing to see it. Uh, so yeah, um, energy is a human right and we, we need to make sure people have access to energy and we in rich countries need to make sure that they have access to um, affordable electric um, uh, electricity. And I will just say one other thing, <laughs> sorry, that. Um, if you're a poor country and you want to provide energy, you want to provide electricity, it's very hard and expensive to get a loan to build some sort of electric um, power station. But a fossil fuel company can come to you and say, look, um, give us your seabed or your forest area and we will extract all this for free we won't charge you anything and then we'll give you some you know we'll give you a basically a cut of the profits and you know what are you going to choose we need to make that equation work should population reduction be promoted if there are so many people who will have to migrate then we need fewer people right what are you suggesting? Smaller families. Smaller families? Yes. Kill all the old people? No. I don't know. <laughs> no, but I mean, I know some young people, they are not planning Kill the to... young people? No. I, no. I no, if you listen to me, some younger people are not willing to have children now because of what's happening in the future. Well, that's a personal choice for young people, and I'm not going to go into anybody's personal choice to have or not have a child. There's another, some people down here. Oh, there's one. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> um, I was just wondering if you if I had thought about the fact that the this may be the end of uh, the Habitat for Humanity, and the Earth may go on without humans on it. I mean, have you thought about that as an option to your suggestion? <laughs> say kill anybody. I mean, there are, there are plenty of dystopian narratives for sure. And if temperatures get worse, there are many ways that we could uh, make this planet even more unsuitable for humans. Um, so what I'm trying to do with my book is um, is take a pragmatic look at where we are now and think about how we could survive a world which is three or four degrees warmer and how we might take pragmatic steps to get there to a better Anthropocene. We have time for one more question and if you don't get a chance to ask yours, come up front and ask Guy yourself. Thanks so much. Um, 
uh, you're, you're, I'm, I'm still working on reading your, your book. I'm, I'm a university professor out here at Grand Valley State University. Um, and I have a question about, uh, um, you know, I'm sure you've thought a lot about this. I mean, here we're on a college campus. Um, you know, where colleges and universities uh, fit into, you know, uh, the future, right? Um, I, was, I, was, I was moved in, and inspired by uh, um, your mention of, I think it was, uh, you know, some countries in, in, in Europe uh, were by the state, if I remember correctly, is paying for young people to engage in, in language instruction for refugees, right? Yeah. Um, and providing support, teaching refugees. So, you know, I think that, you know, especially here in the United States and all across the, the world, we have this massive, incredible infrastructure for knowledge creation, dissemination, sharing. So I'm just curious as to what, what your thoughts are with respect to you know, what it is that colleges and universities can do better to be able to have Yeah, so I think I think colleges and universities actually, actually have a, a huge role to play um, in in all of this because if we're thinking ahead across the century to large numbers of people moving, the best time in your life to make a move is late teens to uh, mid-twenties, right? Because that's when a lot of mobility happens everywhere. A lot of people move to study uh, for apprenticeships, to start jobs. They move to new cities for opportunities. There is a lot of movement then anyway. So it really helps with that, um, that, that inclusivity, basically. And you know, for for universities to take people from um, from the global south, from at risk areas, um, you know, that's where they can uh, learn skills at the same time as creating and developing a network of friendship and um, understanding of the country, and then they can contribute to um, to the productivity when they get jobs in that country, and then they can help you know, once they've developed a bit more of a network, they can help them bring out other family members. And it's not it's not such a jolt as um, large numbers sort of turning up without any uh, without any contacts and friendships. But also, um, you know, there are there are there could be more programs. I've I've seen some really great ones uh, which work with you know, companies, but also universities working with refugee camps, um, people in refugee camps to help give them some sort of education through um, online courses. You know, we have technology now so that we can do a lot of things remotely. You don't have to be in the place. And that can, it means that they can help learn a language or that they can just have some experience and understanding of the customs and uh, the, how things work in a different country. And it just makes it easier for them to transition, to make that transition. Because of course, it's, it's really hard to move country. I, I don't know how many of you have done it, but you know, we're all, we're all migrants of some, who here lives in the same house that they were born in? We've all moved, right? We move for love, for education to start our own families to for curiosity to travel we all move you know some of us move across borders um it's much easier when you speak the language when you have some sort of understanding and when you have you're able to bring new skills you know because you you've learned something let's thank gaia again for coming such a long way to be with us <laughs>